Uh, first of all, I'm delighted to be here today, um, and many thanks to Kaminda for asking me to speak. Um, it's a real pleasure. So today, I want to talk to you about failure. Um, but before I do, does anyone know what day it is today? Yes, it is the 29th. But it's also a very important historical day in our industry. Um, 50 years ago today, a student called Charlie Klein sent the first ever digital transmission across California, which printed out on an ITT teletype machine at Stanford University. And the message read simply, L-O, two letters, LO. It was the first ever exchange of data over ARPANET, which became the foundation of today's internet. But, most people don't know, that was based on a failure. Klein actually typed the word login into his teletype terminal, but halfway through the transmission, ARPANET crashed, and only the first two letters ever arrived. <clears throat> Human Endeavour has a long and glorious history of failure. My own experience of this failure has been through the lens of agile software development. I've been a Java developer since the turn of the millennium, just before the Agile Manifesto was penned. So it's been a constant theme throughout my career. I see agile software development as a perfect environment for hypothesis-based learning. We have an idea. We build something which we can release quickly into a high standard because we have continuous integration in place. Of course we do. And we also have automated progression testing. Then we gather data from its live usage, which allows us to learn. Often, we learn that, as Edison did with many of his hypotheses, the idea wasn't quite right. So we begin again. It becomes like a virtual cycle of learning based on the ability to fail. <coughs> And because we've released little and often, the price of failure is as small as it can be. It's a bit like evolution, excuse the multiple science references. The product we're, we're building adapts to its natural environment, one mutation at a time, and the fittest survive. But there's a problem. Some people don't get that. And they're usually they're the people with the checkbooks, people paying for us to do the development. In business, failure tends to be a bit of a dirty word. I call this failure with a big F. If agile is powered by failure with a small F, business doesn't like that, and it sees it as failure with a big F. Or at least you can't use the terminology, you have to think of a different way of phrasing it. So, we did some research a while back, having a, having a think about this. Um, we talked to 300 CIOs across the UK and the US. And in their eyes, one in three Agile projects was a complete failure. Now, I find that very strange, a very counterintuitive for a method of developing software that's designed to effectively eliminate failure by embracing it and using it as a virtue. So, it captured my attention, and I began to, to find more and more references. So Forbes, a couple of years back, 84% of companies are failing in digital transformation. And just yesterday, McKinsey published a survey saying that 45% of all digital transformations are failing to produce the profit that's expected. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about was the things no one tells you. When you do agile software development, I think there's a, there's a view that it's easy to get started. The barriers to entry are low. You can hire a few contractors, fire up an Amazon account with a credit card, uh, download some open source libraries, and off you go. And everything will be fine. But I think those of us who've seen that movie before and been around the track a few times know that it isn't quite as easy as all of that. 
So what I wanted to do with you uh, do is share with you some of the things that no one tells you, some of the things I've learned in my 19 years of experience um, that I think you, can't, you kind of can't teach. You kind of have to live. And the first one is Agile itself. I think people think you can do a, a Scrum Master course, you can read a few books and a few web, website, uh, web, um, web pages, and, and you're good to go. That's not true in my experience. Agile is ex extremely difficult, Agile software development. And most of it is, is experience-led. It's learnt on the job. Um, so in, in an industry where there's a tendency to get people who are cheaper, who haven't got that experience, this leads to a lot of failure, or at least perceived failure. The second one is something that is, is in tension with Agile itself, which I like to call the first rule of software. Curiously, I've never got to the second rule of software in my career. If anyone's got any suggestions, I'd be happy to hear them. Um, but the first rule of software says, what goes live stays live. So you think about it. When you have a chance to negotiate around what you would consider to be a piece of potential technical debt that you're about to put live into a system and put in front of users, you will never have a better case than you do before you do it. The minute it's live, attention and budget and everyone's focus will have shifted away from that potential mistake onto the next new shiny or painful thing that needs dealing with. So in a, in a, in a world where we're expecting to be able to put things live and then change them, this is a common problem in environments where Agile potentially hasn't reached a level of maturity that we all might like to think it would do. I talk a lot about the difference between a project and a product. A project is something that is bound by time, cost, and resources, normally in the shape of people. You can have a team of a certain size, you can have a certain amount of money, and it's got to be done by this date. Again, that doesn't lend itself very well to Agile, which is really a change-tolerant methodology. The whole idea is I can identify a small slice of scope, I can build a, a small piece that I can put in front of the users, and then I can begin to learn what we like to call, or some of us don't like to call it, but anyway, a minimum viable product. The whole idea is that it will enter a cycle of change. And there are two ingredients in that. There's the product itself, and then there's the team required to change it. So I've come up with a new definition of what, what I like to think of as legacy software. Legacy software is, is software you've lost the ability to change. So the whole idea is it was built to be changed. It's following an agile software development methodology. But you've taken the team away. At that point, what's it, you've, you've now made it a fixed point, and you can't change it. So it's now legacy. It's now a problem that someone's going to have to pick, pick up and fix later on. So my message here is that something that no one tells you when you embark on an Agile project is the team you've put in place expects them to be there potentially forever. The analogy I like to use is the iPhone. So the iPhone is a product. The engineering team that underpins it are not ever going to be stood down until they stop selling iPhones. And really what we're evolving is the blueprint of the iPhone. That's what the team's there to do. And it's the same with software. Now, discipline. I think a lot of people see agile software development as a bit like an, an anarchic approach to building things. But in reality, it, agile software development requires an incredible amount of self-discipline for the team. The idea of something like Scrum, in my view, is it sets some guide rails. It sets some limits and some rules for the team to obey. So you're expected to run planning sessions. You're expected to run retrospectives. You're expected to do demos every sprint. You should have sprint goals. You guys probably all know this, right? But how many times have you seen the wheels come off that? How many times have you, has the team slipped on its discipline because maybe it didn't have the right balance of experience? Maybe it was put under pressure by a business stakeholder um, trying to move us more towards the world of gates where we're expected to hit targets. Um, 
The idea of Agile is you empower the team, but you do it within a certain confined context where they, there's a contract between the person doing the empowering and the team. I've also seen teams lose the reality of this and, and be over-empowered, um, which can be interesting as well. So it's sort of a two-way contract, if you like. Trust. Trust is the currency of Agile. Without trust, you will fail. I've learned this more in the latter part of my career where I've moved away from being a software developer to more of someone involved in the business of providing software development to our clients. So think about this. Imagine you wanted to build a house. Now, you'd have a budget. Let's say you had a big budget, like 200,000 pounds, for example. And you knew you needed to be in by the summer because, I don't know why, but you do. Um, like most deadlines, there probably isn't a great reason. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, so you, you find a builder, and you sit down, and you have a discussion about how you're going to work the project. And the builder says, you know what? Let's not bother with design. Let's not have any architects. I'll just go and buy some bricks and some tools, get a couple of the guys. Probably the, the multidisciplinary disciplinary team will get a carpenter, we'll get an electrician. We'll get a bricky and a few others, and we'll start building. If we make any mistakes, we'll just, we'll just dig it up and you know, learn as we go. What do you think of that? Well, you know, I'm a bit worried. What about my budget and my, my time frame? Well, you know, as long as we can let the scope change, everything will be fine. So you know, you, at the moment, you think you want a three-story house, but we might not make it that far. We, we might make it to a four-story house. Who knows? Um, and maybe we'll get a swimming pool, but maybe we won't. A couple of kitchens, I don't know. We'll find out as we go, because that's what we're going to do. We're going to build things and show them to you and let you define the journey. And we'll work together, and it'll be based on trust. I'm pretty sure most people in this room wouldn't like that contract. Um, I certainly wouldn't. But whenever I speak to a client about engaging commercially over an agile software project, interesting, um, that's the conversation I find myself having. And it's an extremely difficult sell. And it's, it's also an extremely difficult buy for the client. The client doesn't know how to buy things like that because it doesn't appear to make sense when the, the, the key ingredient, the trust, doesn't exist at the beginning of the relationship. Once you're up and running and the trust is built, then this can be proven to work. But at the beginning, it's very, very difficult. I think it, when I was a... Um, a software developer, I never got to see this. I was already injected into situations where the trust had been built, the commercial contracts had been signed, and they were built to either frustrate or to enable this process. And I've worked in both environments. So trust is an absolutely critical component. <coughs> DevOps automation and testing. I've been thinking about the relationship between agile software development and DevOps. I think they are codependent. You can't have one without the other. Or potentially, you can't be agile without having DevOps in place and automated testing. Because if you build an increment on your agile project and you can't release it quickly and safely in a way that you know isn't going to break what you've already got out in front of your users, then all is lost and the whole thing falls apart. So having continuous integration, testing, and flexible components like cloud, et cetera, means you can't change, which means you can't be agile. So DevOps and agile are very important partners. Stakeholder buy-in. Grassroots is not enough. I've seen many environments that start off with a new agile initiative where we're going to start doing all this cool, agile stuff that die on the vine very, very quickly. They get strangled at birth. The, the room runs out of oxygen. And before long, we're back to doing it the old way. Um, I think it's incredibly important, well, I know it is, to get senior buy-in, <laughs> preferably board level, if you can, but certainly in the senior technology leadership. So, Grassroots doesn't work very often. It can do. It can catch fire, and it can 
can work. I think you, you, what, you will, what will happen then is you've found yourself in an organization where there was always an appetite for it. It was just undiscovered. So they are out there. But in reality, I think it's such a big mind shift for most organizations. It requires leadership. It requires somebody with a voice at the top table to champion it. Demonstrating progress. So back to that over-empowerment of agile teams. Sometimes an agile team will sit there and build software off into the, off into the wild blue yonder, building away, creating this wonderful product that no one else knows what's going on. No one knows how it's going, how fast we're going. It's a bit like flying an airplane without any instruments. You might be upside down. You might be in a cloud. You might be headed for a mountain. You don't know. The other thing I've seen uh, a lot of is a bad relationship developing between the, the economic buyer of the software and the supplier. And that could be in an internal team within an organization or between a supplier and a buyer of the, of, of the um, agile software engineering service. So the best tool I have found to manage that complex relationship is a burn-up chart. Now, most people know what a burn-down chart is. But a lot of people don't use these guys. Burn up charts, think of a graph, time and scope. <coughs> on, scope on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. Now, what most organizations will do is start to measure how many story points, because normally we measure agile progress in story points, not in time. We'll start to measure the progress of the team how many story points are we completing per day, per week, per sprint, per time increment across the bottom? So we, we have an upward, upward curve that's a bit bumpy to start with. But before long, what we've done is we've generated some really good evidence. Not, we're not guessing anymore. We've now got evidence of how productive this Agile team is. So we can see and we can prove to the business this team goes this fast. And my point has always been there's nothing you're going to do by the, by the time you get to sort of sprint three or four. Caffeine doesn't work. Um, weird. Anyway, um, by the time you get to sprint three or four, you will know how fast your team is going, and you will now have evidence that will tell you when you're going to finish the amount of scope you started with. But the twist is there are two lines on this graph. The top line is how much scope does the business want at the outset? which will be set on the y-axis. Let's say it's 100 story points. And the team begins to progress at 10 story points a sprint or something, um, which varies team by team, obviously. And um, it can change from week to week, month to month, story to story. But eventually, there will be some sort of trend that emerges that allows you to kind of get an idea of how fast this team goes. You can now, draw, you can now extrapolate a line to where the 100 points will cross with the, the trajectory of the team, the velocity of the team, and we will know when we're going to finish. So now we actually have, unlike many other ways of developing software, proper evidence about when we expect this team to finish. And we can tell whether we're going to be in our house by the summer or not. But the twist is, that 100 story points is a line that also moves. Because on day two of the project, we now have a bunch of stakeholders who want another 200 story points. Uh, so you now have two upward curves, one at the top, one at the bottom. Now, the worst situation you can end up in is what we like to call the jaws of death, where the top line is going in that direction, the bottom line is going in that direction, and the two will never meet, which means you will never be finished. The symptom of that is lots of emotional shouting, usually in the direction of the development team. Uh, that's usually because um, there's a lot of emotion in the room, and nobody has any evidence to demonstrate what's going on. In reality, this, this tool will allow you to show that there are two parts to this equation. The, the number of times I've drawn up a burn-up chart and seen the business immediately react, the top curve immediately goes down. Because you realize at that point you have three options. Can the project, because it's never going to finish, hire another development team, which will double your cost, which you said was fixed. So now you need 400 grand to finish that house. Or you can adjust the scope. You can reduce the scope. So we're back to that trust relationship. We're back to that builder saying, 
let's tear up that bit of footings we just did because I don't think it's going to work. So that is the only way it works, and it is a really difficult conversation. Architecting for Agile. So I bet you were wondering when I was going to get to the Comunda part. <laughs> um, so Comunda, I, I've always liked. Um, we as a company have been involved with a lot of the work being done by the public sector in this UK through the government digital service. There's been a strong push towards open source. So my initial interest in Comunda was around the fact that we had an enterprise grade um, process automation tool that was open source, ticked all the boxes. Um, back in the day, government was using all of the big vendor tools that some of you might remember. Some of those aren't doing quite as well as they were. However, Comunda is going from strength to strength. I think one of the reasons why is because it, it implies some sort of architectural blueprint that most of the experienced software engineers in the room would probably reach for in a green field. So we're going to probably be using the cloud, probably be going as north as we can from IS up to PaaS and up into SaaS where we can. Databases as services and great things like that, lambdas, functions as services. We're going to break, break things into tiny pieces, microservices, that are easy to change that can be released independently. And we're going to separate concerns. We're going to take things like our user interfaces and decouple them from underlying services and data. But we're also going to take our processes that we automate, and we're going to concentrate those in an enterprise process tool. I think Kaminda implies that architecture, which I really like. And finally, my last unteachable is data. So this, again, is something I learned from working with on various um, public sector projects. The analogy I like, well, it's not an analogy, it's a real example, is how many times, so who uses Google Analytics here on their website? So do you have a development team that can take that data and change the website based on what you learned? If you don't, turn off Google Analytics because it's completely pointless, unless you're using a content management system. Um, really, we're into this virtual cycle that I was talking about. We build something, we, re we release and test it, test and release it. Uh, we put it in front of users, we see how it performs, and we get real evidence. User research is great, but that's a lab. The best place to test the software is out in the wild. If we can measure what happens, we can then use data to inform what to do next. We determine at this point, and we have evidence to prove and to immediately suck all emotion out of any boardroom or any, any uh, TDA or whatever situation we find, us, find ourselves in, that it worked or that it didn't work, which is fine because we're allowed to fail. Without this final component of data, you're missing the feedback element. Absolutely critical. And the number of times I see this, people focusing on this, but standing down the Agile team. So there's no way to actually affect the change that you've now just proved needs to happen. So, nearly done. Um, a couple of takeaways. I, I, just, I thought we'd sort of concentrate all these on one slide, although they are really a more sort of unteachables. Um, agile software development is actually quite risky. The chance of failure is actually quite high, and it isn't necessarily the, the failure with a small F, it's the failure with a big F, which is really not the perception of the team, it's the perception of the business. We might think we're doing a great job, but in reality, the, the end result, based on some people who don't necessarily understand you know, our set of values and ways of working as, as agile software engineers, might be very different. Having experience on the team is key. Like I say, I firmly believe you can't really teach Agile beyond a certain point. You can probably read about everything you need to know in a book in half an hour. But does that really mean you're going to go off and deliver successful projects for the next decade? Probably not. You're probably going to spend that decade learning how to do it, getting the battle scars actually out in the field. Um, this is, I've always thought of this as a, a real downside of Agile software engineering because if there's no way to teach it, then how do we learn it in an industry that is 
stuck in a, in a sort of talent shortage. Um, it's, it's a difficult problem to solve. And the, the reality is you can only grow it. You have to nurture the talent. You have to make sure that your agile teams are, are built up of a mix of experience, juniors and seniors, experienced and the people who are doing their apprenticeships. Without that, this is not a sustainable way of doing things. And finally, surprisingly, building bespoke software is not cheap. So I think a lot of people think that this is the case. However, the basic maths are the average Agile team is at least 10 people, in my view. Oh, sorry about that. If you take the average cost of a contractor or an employee and you multiply it by, I don't know, how, do we, how long do we think it takes to do a minimum viable product, uh, product and then go on to do a bit of development? I think at least somewhere between three to nine months for, for a not particularly big project. Multiply that by the price of a contractor, which I'll leave you to do the math in your own head. Multiply that by 10. We're into millions of pounds per product. And you need to keep that team forever, potentially. There's an ongoing tax, which most people don't factor in. So bear that in mind. Right. My unteachable's done. I hope that was informative. Um, let me uh, just sign off. So as I mentioned earlier, we're a Comunda certified partner here in London. 6.6 um, .6 runs a user group. And so please um, have a look up on, on Meetup app. Uh, and we run it sort of re relatively regularly, so um, we're trying to build a presence and, and get as many people as possible to come along, so we'd, we'd welcome you. Um, it's great to see everyone here today, and, and again, thanks to Commander and thanks to all of you for coming.